Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and even good night, depending on where you are, ladies and gentlemen. I say this because, um, I mean, uh, it seems that we are, have attendees from many different parts of the world. I am Miguel Angel Medina. I am IP lawyer of the El Faburu law firm, frequently dealing with GIs, trademarks, domains, and related matters, and a member of Mark's council and of its GI team, which I had the honor to chair for some years. I am the moderator of this session, although for what I have talked with our speakers previously, I have the impression that it might not be necessary a moderator as they seem to be rather moderate persons. I welcome you to this very interesting session where we are going to deal with some of the hottest topics in the GI world and even in the IP world, I would dare to say. Uh, although the globalization had already made ground the importance of the internet and vice versa, now the unfortunate pandemic that we are going through has confined us in an increasingly real virtual world, keeping us more distant from the physical world that we used to call the real world and making us live, live more and more in what we used to call the virtual world, which has now become so real that nowadays real and virtual are one and the same thing, at least in some aspects. Not that many physical shops are closed, that there are limitations of circulation and opening hours in the physical stores. To be able to sell in the internet is essential and to use a domain name that identifies you before the consumers and to avoid all the misappropriation of your domains and your reputation and your presence in the internet has become critical. Here today, we will focus on GIs and their prisons, protection and infringement through the domain name system and the internet. Basically, we shall deal with protecting GIs on the internet, sales platforms and domain name system. For this purpose, we count on three great experts on the field, Ms. Irene Calvoli, Ms. Yvette Paulovitz, and Mr. Georges Novaish whose detailed biographies you can consult on the website of this event. Each of them will speak 10 minutes on certain aspects of these matters. And as I assume that you will have many questions on these subjects, please be so kind to use the Q, Q and A box. So questions and answer box in your computer as questions come to your mind. Then when our three experts have finished, then all their, uh, all their speeches, we shall open the discussions where I will be posing them a selection of the questions that we have uh, with our team managed uh, to select among those which we have received. Then we uh, can start now. We do it with uh, Ms. Irene Calvoli, who is professor at law, uh, of law at uh, the Texas AM University School of Law, in addition to being uh, also academically linked to other universities and acting as an IP expert for national governments and international organizations, author of a broad uh, variety of, of uh, important publications and frequent speaker. So uh, Ms. Calvoli, the floor is yours. Um, hi, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, um, and good evening, uh, depending where you are. Uh, our panel, as mentioned, is going to deal with issues related to domain names and the relationship between domain names and geographical indications. My uh, contribution is that of setting the stage and so I'm going to quickly discuss, but I asked, you know, I know uh, the audience is very expert um, and I'm talking to, you know, to the best of the best in the field. Um, so just, just some remarks about, uh, about the current status of the domain name system and GIs. Um, so the premise of this discussion in the panel, because the panel really relates to enforcement, is that at this stage, the, um, nuances and the national um, solution that have been found in the brick and mortar world are not translated into the cyberspace. So we have um, a situation in which geographical indication as such, not as trademark, but as such, 
are not recognized as intellectual property titles by the domain name system and those who regulate the domain name system. And primarily uh, the UDRP, uh, ICANN, uh, you know, of course the ICANN system and, and the, the main uh, legal instrument used to resolve dispute, uh, which is the UDRP or UDRP style type of dispute resolution. And so the existing challenges for enforcement are twofold, primarily. One is the cyber squatting, type of squatting, um, abuse, uh, lookalike type of abuse. Uh, um, and so bad faith registrations or bad faith uh, uses of geographical indication that are recognized as geographical indication in a given jurisdiction. And then there is the second challenge, which is a different challenge. And I want to again echo what Professor Dev Ganji said in the, the keynote earlier. We need to strike a balance between legitimate enforcement and legitimate uh, competitive uses. And so the second issue is really when a name, it's a GI in country A, but it's generic term in country B, um, and cyberspace doesn't really recognize this country A, country B, unless we are down into the, the, the domain, uh, you know, for country or country B, but the .org, the .com, uh, and many of the new um, GTLD don't recognize that type of territoriality, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And this is a different issue than bad faith, but it's still an issue that is relevant. Um, and so the question is, should we use public agreement, a public solution? Should we use private agreement? I believe in a combination of the two uh, and perhaps some targeted approaches. But um, uh, I think the system as is, uh, is proving to work fairly well. Uh, my main suggestion would be, and I was saying the same yesterday at the WIPO Standing Committee on Trademarks at Geographic Indication uh, Information Session, I believe geographic indication should be recognized as IP title as well, with of course the caveat of the fact that I, geographic indication will not be recognized to be uh, protected everywhere because there are issues of generic, you know, genericism. But that's the same with trademarks. Some trademarks are protected in country A and country B and are generic in country C and D. Uh, and so I don't see that to be really um, a major change, uh, but I would uh, um, warn against major changing in the wording of the UDRP uh, or other, um, other, uh, other legal instrument, because I believe the adjudicators do have enough uh, provision to work uh, through, and these are very much a fact-based type of assessment and adjudication. Um, so um, to quickly continue, um, um, uh, the definition, of course, everybody knows definition. Um, and uh, um, now the slides are going too fast. I'm sorry about that. Um, and uh, um, and uh, and so uh, the UDRP, as you know, as uh, within the UDRP, we have uh, um, we have specific provision uh, related to bad faith. Uh, we have Article Four, um, you know, Four B and Four A. Four uh, A sets all the stages for uh, what a complainant should. Um, should assess and the element of the complainant um, are um, that they need to assess that there is a, a right on a, on a trademarks that the the um, you know the respondent does not have a legitimate interest to use it and then uh, uh, that there is a, a bad faith in the registration and use of the you know of that specific domain name. Uh, the UIPO has done a very good study of uh, uh, the UDRP and similar uh, provision uh, that have been uh, provided, you know, that have been designed in UDRP style system. Um, and uh, um, at the general level, um, uh, I think it's important to, and um, the slides are going by themselves at this point, I'm sorry, but you know, it's okay. Um, we have several WIPO cases that have been decided um, in the 
um, uh, under the, the wipe of mediation and arbitration um, that goes from the very famous Champagne case uh, in which uh, the champagne.co domain name was not found to be um, registered in bad faith for the reason that certification marks at that point were not found to be um, um, to be actually a, a sufficient title, not just a GI, but even a certification trademark was not enough to trigger um, the UDRP because a, a certification mark did was found not to identify the individual producer and so could not really function as a trademark the, uh, as the traditional way uh, the UDRP was set for trademarks uh, and for the system to be enforced. Um, then the Rioja case, which is a 2018 case, um, also didn't find bad faith. I think in that case, some interesting questions were, um, were found related particularly to exhaustion. Uh, so uh, not just issues of genericness, but if I am a reseller of genuine products in country X that doesn't recognize that specific GI or even recognize that specific GI, and I decide to open a shop that is called, say, Parmigiano Reggiano resale.com. Can I do that? Um, uh, I'm saying nothing but what I'm doing. My use is descriptive, but I use the name that is a geographic indication. Um, can I do that? Uh, from you know an exhaustion and resale standpoint. So this is also opens up you know new question. The Parmaham.com and the Parmashinkan.com are two very interesting cases because one was found uh, in favor, uh, was not found in favor of complainant, but eventually Parmashinkan was found in favor of complainant. But here again, these are very highly fact-based decision. And last, I want to mention this decision, Gorgonzola Vest, that was uh, uh, decided in January 20, 2020. And here, I think we see a bit of a change in the interpretation of the adjudicator. And the change is uh, under the UDRP, all the evidence have to be presented by um, the claimant. But here, uh, the, 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 the reasoning was um, in the evidence of the contrary, uh, we found that this is bad faith. And uh, um, um, the, the, the change between the champagne.com case to the Gorgonzola dog best case is really the trademarks invoked um, where there was not discussion over the fact um, that this mark is a collective mark and there is no uh, there was no you know the, the possibility to, to identify or not the individual Gorgonzola producer and that is actually a very um, uh, to me a welcome change uh, in the jurisprudence. And so, um, you know, if these slides will continue, uh, I want to call you all, and here I you know my 10 minutes are running out, uh, on the current discussion that is happening at the multilateral level. These are very useful uh, document for, and they're public document in the WIPO website that all of you can check, and I strongly suggest you to check particularly the responses to the questionnaire. Um, and, uh, um, um, you know, uh, the dot wine and dot van, uh, van, uh, van uh, were useful private agreement, but here again, we know that wine and spirit continue to have a much stronger level of agreement than other geographic indication across the world. And so uh, while this might be welcoming private initiative, uh, it's also not necessarily what could happen, say, in the cheese world and so on. And uh, um, to conclude, uh, I want to say that I believe uh, um, that uh, multinational uh, and bilateral, so multilateral and bilateral and plurilateral agreement could in fact include um, some uh, uh, specific provision about regulation of domain name and uh, the relationship with GIs. But again, here the first thing to remember is that when a name is generic in country X, the first thing we need to do is claw it back. Uh, and so there should be an agreement that the name is no longer generic. And when that, 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 that's the case, then a IP title uh, through a GI could be, uh, could be recognized and as such perhaps enforced in the domain name world. Uh, and so with that, I, I leave the stage to my wonderful co-panelists and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm sure it will uh, have prompted many, many questions. So I think I was saying that, thank you. I don't know if you have heard me, but I just repeat that. Thank you very much for your 
very interesting uh, session, which I think uh, it will have prompted for sure many uh, questions from our audience. And now we are lucky to have Ms. Uh, Yvette Pavlovich. Uh, Yvette is, uh, uh, among other many things, a practitioner, an IP lawyer, and uh, UDRP panelist, author of comparative studies on behalf of the European institutions. One of them is uh, this very interesting, which have taken place uh, uh, regarding the evaluation of practices for combating uh, speculative and abusive EU domain name registrations. And now uh, she will speak about GIs and uh, country code TLDs and about the practices for combating speculative and abusive domain name registrations. Yvette, as you wish. Thank you very much, Miguel. It's a honor to speak uh, uh, at this conference and uh, thank you for the organizers. Uh, I will talk about CCTLDs and GIs and the practices for combating speculative and abusive domain name registration under uh, such CCTLDs. Uh, only um, just to start uh, with some uh, numbers uh, uh, to put into context the CCTLDs, uh, these 2019 online world maps, uh, uh, world map, uh, uh, as you can see, it uh, looks a bit odd. Uh, don't worry about the bubbles if you cannot see the text because it's not relevant now. Uh, um, the important thing that uh, you can see here is that uh, the size of the countries are relative uh, not to their geographical size, but the number of the CCTLDs under management. In 2020, uh, we have uh, 375 million domain name registrations across all uh, TLDs. Uh, with a split of 66% uh, of uh, to uh, GTLDs and 34% uh, to CCTLDs. Uh, so uh, in Europe, uh, we have uh, under management, uh, uh, the domains are estimated to be at 71 million, which would mean the 55% uh, of all the CCTLDs uh, uh, registered worldwide. This is a relevant number. And uh, um, as we could see, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has certainly given a boost uh, to the domain name registrations, uh, since many businesses shifted from the physical to online sale. Such situation uh, uh, is exploited by bad actors too, uh, and uh, uh, who are carrying out uh, abusive registrations. A recent study of the European Commission on the evaluation of practices for combating speculative and uh, abusive domain name registrations uh, um, analyzed several uh, CCTLDs within Europe uh, and uh, measures uh, used as good practices uh, uh, by such registries to fight uh, such kind of abusive registrations. Div different measures were uh, identified in a such study, uh, which can be divided in preventive measures and curative measures. Preventive measures are the measures uh, that are uh, used during the registration procedure, so they can prevent uh, that domain name are registered. Curative measures are obviously used uh, post the, in the post-delegation phase, so once the domain name is registered. Uh, due to uh, time constraints, uh, we will ha not have the chance to discuss with you all of these uh, measures. So I will skip uh, some of my slides, but uh, I would like to analyze some of the preventive and some of the curative measures. So one of the preventive measures uh, uh, and good practice uh, that can be used is uh, providing for publicly accessible list of domain name registration requests and allow a sufficient time period for the right holders to subject objections or to the registry or the registrars or uh, ADR providers by uh, uh, those right holders uh, who have prior rights uh, and could uh, 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 found uh, a domain name registration infringing with their rights. 
uh, under the .hu, there exists uh, 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 this proceeding and uh, this practice that the requests are published uh, uh, for eight days on the website of the uh, .hu registry and right holders can uh, file an objection and uh, uh, in that way prevent that domain names arrive to registration. Another uh, 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 important uh, preventive measures, uh, measure uh, related uh, especially to uh, geographical indications is carrying out cross-checks uh, on behalf of the uh, registry uh, in uh, official registers. Uh, for, related to uh, uh, geographical indications in the EU, this uh, register could be Ambrosia, which is the official EU register for the uh, indica geographical indications in EU. So uh, there are some countries, um, for example, and registries, for example, .eu, .dk, uh, .hu, and .uk, uh, which carry out cross-checks during the uh, registration procedure, but such checks are limited to business registries and trademark registries. Uh, they are not uh, verifying uh, if there are uh, uh, geographical re uh, indications uh, registered in some uh, registers. Another uh, uh, important uh, preventive measure is uh, 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 domain blocking services. There is uh, currently no practice within the CCTLDs, uh, especially in, the, in Europe, uh, to uh, offer uh, such kind of service, allowing uh, right holders to preventively block uh, uh, infringing domain name registrations. But we can see on the GTLD market that there are uh, some kind of uh, services, uh, uh, just like as uh, uh, Donuts uh, uh, service, uh, uh, which is one of the biggest uh, 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 um, registry operator of the new GTLDs, uh, which is using domain protected marks list uh, based on trademark clearing house. So uh, since uh, in trademark clearing house uh, repository, uh, we can find also uh, GIs uh, currently. Uh, it could be a, a, uh, a useful uh, service uh, which could be uh, used also by the European CCTLDs. Let's see now some of the curative measures. So uh, one of the uh, uh, curative measure uh, which uh, could be used after the delegation of domain name is uh, implementing and improving alert system uh, to uh, receive uh, notifications if uh, uh, there is any identical or similar domain names registered. Uh, this uh, uh, kind of service uh, uh, is already offered uh, by uh, URID, which is the uh, .eu registry, in collaboration with EU IPO. Uh, but such kind of uh, service uh, is uh, limited uh, to the holders of EU uh, uh, EU trademark uh, uh, who can uh, set up alerts and receive uh, 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 a notification if uh, an identical .eu domain name is registered. This system could also be uh, 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 implemented in other countries and extended also to GIs and uh, 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 not only to uh, uh, EU uh, trademarks. Uh, among the curative measures, uh, uh, it's also important for the right holders to exactly know uh, who to contact if there is a, a possible abuse. So uh, 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 publishing uh, uh, such kind of information uh, uh, and uh, uh, raising awareness on that is uh, very important. Uh, regarding other proceedings, uh, which are uh, uh, among the curative measures, uh, there could be uh, uh, improvement of such systems in, in the, under the European CCTLDs. 
Uh, for example, uh, there uh, could be also uh, preliminary proceedings before ADR disputes, and there are good examples under the .hu, the .it, the .dk, and .uk uh, um, CCTLDs. Uh, in uh, .hu, as I mentioned, there is the objection proceeding, which is a, a, a kind of preventive measure since it's in the pre-delegation phase, but it's still a preliminary ADR proceeding. Under the .it, uh, 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 there is the mandatory opposition uh, uh, which uh, uh, um, is uh, uh, a mandatory proceeding to obtain the lock of the domain name. And in that way, a curative measure, a preliminary uh, um, with respect to ADR proceeding. And uh, uh, disputes can be resolved also in that phase, not only arriving uh, at the end of the uh, uh, ADR without introducing a subsequent ADR uh, uh, proceeding. And uh, there are also mediation proceedings uh, which could be used uh, uh, in, in disputes. Regarding uh, uh, still uh, ADR proceedings, it could also uh, be important to introduce some fast track proceedings like uh, uh, proceedings similar to the URS and uh, under the uh, in United States, uh, US, uh, uh, it is possible to use such kind of proceeding. And also in uh, Denmark under uh, uh, .dk, it is possible to use a, a very fast proceeding in case of obvious type of squatting, which uh, concludes in 72 hours. Another important uh, measure would be to harmonize uh, uh, the uh, uh, ADIA rules uh, within uh, uh, the EU to expressly recognize GIs as legitimate IP rights to qualify as prior rights. Also, uh, uh, um, Professor Kalboli mentioned this issue uh, and uh, uh, she said uh, uh, she doesn't uh, uh, um, suggest to make uh, modifications under the UDRP. Uh, in, uh, within the CCTLDs uh, in the EU, we can see that there are some countries where uh, uh, GIs are expressly recognized like uh, uh, under the .EU and under the .BA and also other countries like Spain. Uh, and there are some other countries where it is not a problem to obtain such kind of protection. But still, it would be important that within the EU, uh, we align and harmonize the uh, ADIA rules of the different CCTLDs to recognize such uh, 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 GIs. Uh, as mentioned also by uh, Professor Kalbury, it's, uh, it's not uh, the only solution. So uh, disputes are always uh, fact-based and there could be uh, still uh, 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 issues if uh, 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 there is no uh, uh, bad face registration. So uh, it's not uh, the only solution uh, and solutions are to be balanced, uh, uh, obviously. And uh, as conclusion, I can say that uh, uh, um, it is important to use uh, both preventive uh, and curative measures in order to uh, uh, avoid that uh, abusive registrations are carried out by bad actors. Uh, and uh, certainly the harmonization uh, can enhance legal certainty uh, throughout the EU. But there should be a, a balance between the measures and uh, uh, not all measures, uh, it doesn't mean that all measures uh, that are analyzed or are good practices uh, can be used in, in different jurisdictions. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I give back the floor to Miguel. Thank you very much, Yvette, for this uh, wonderful and comprehensive uh, overview of uh, preventive and curative measures, which is something that uh, we need very much uh, uh, nowadays. And now um, uh, is the time for Mr. Georges Novais, who works in the unit F3, unit intellectual property of uh, DigiGrow. Jorge will, uh, George will speak about the legal tools for tackling uh, GI infringement online and uh, also about the, the interesting projects of the European Commission to protect uh, GIs in the internet world. George, uh, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Miguel, and hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> yes, my, my name is Jorge Novaes, as explained, and I work in the Intellectual Property Unit of DigiGrow in the Commission. I will um, ask access to my uh, presentation. Here it is. So the focus is on online sale of goods infringing geographic indications. I must say, despite the title, that my presentation will not focus on geographic indications themselves for the mere fact that we think we, we, we will speak about uh, goods infringing IPR in, in, in general. Uh, there is no specific solution for um, the infringing of uh, GIs. Uh, and in fact, there is li very little solutions, very little framework for, for, for the protection of um, of IP rights in general, uh, as regards online sale goods. Uh, the, as I will explain now, um, the starting point that we have is the e-commerce directive. Um, we, and we reading the e-commerce directive, what the first um, principle is that online marketplaces, so we are talking about um, marketplaces such as uh, eBay, for example, or Amazon, they are not required to monitor the information which they transmit. They are not required to actively seek uh, facts or circumstances indicating legal activity. And as a result, they are not liable for the information stored by traders. So a third party puts for sale a product infringing an IP right in one platform. The platform, based on these three uh, principles, has no liability, no obligation to check uh, and that's this is the starting point. And from the point of view of IP right holders, it's not a very good one. Um, but um, but the e-commerce says more. So online marketplaces may become liable if they actually know that there is an illegal activity. And of course, the way of making them uh, knowing is, is bringing knowledge to them. Um, so if we inform uh, as a lawyer of uh, 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 well um, or holder of an IP right or geographic indication included, um, if we inform um, uh, the platform that there is uh, someone selling goods that uh, infringe an IP right, uh, then the platform is obliged to act expeditiously. And if they don't do so, then they can become liable. In other words, uh, this is uh, all about notice and takedown procedures, and sometimes also we can call it notice and action procedures. Uh, in fact, notice and action is better because it's not just about taking down, but also um, to, 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 to keep down, let's say. Um, let's move then into the notice and takedowns. Um, they are not regulated. So uh, we only have the e-commerce directive that is this basic principle about knowledge or giving knowledge. And so the system is highly inefficient because each marketplace has its own procedure or even then at the very beginning, what you have to do is try to find them, let's say, uh, maybe there was not a moment that, well, at the very, uh, beginning, maybe we would have to try to find a telephone number of the platform and call and say, listen, I saw something in your platform that is uh, infringing my IP rights. <laughs> um, but that is not the case anymore. Most uh, uh, pl uh, platforms have, have an, a structured procedure to provide um, consumers and right holders with the possibility of giving notice. Uh, but on the other hand, also the, each right holder has his own manner of providing a notice, which is not good for platforms. So everyone brings a different kind of uh, notice with a different kind of evidence. And so that's why we uh, then came, we, the Commission, with the recommendation on measures to effectively tackle illegal content online. And this, I must say, is something that is horizontal, is not, is not uh, focused on IP rights, but all kind of uh, illegal content. And we have a certain number of principles that uh, the platforms should have these mechanisms, put up these mechanisms, uh, should be easy. Notice provided by right holders should be precise and substantiated. Um, hosting service providers must then provide feedback on the decision taken on the notice and the steps that were taken. Um, 
th there's a lot of uh, different principles that the recommendation um, rec well recommends, um, and 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 because I was I think I should move more quickly, but um, th these are the basic principles. Um, hosting service providers should also try to take proactive measures if they can use automated means to detect illegal content, for example, is another. Then we move into uh, the, the remit of uh, counterfeiting and IPRs. Um, we have the Commission uh, started uh, um, an MOU initiative where we brought together uh, several platforms and right owners and tried to agree on our practices, um, implementing the, the, the recommendation and going, be, and going beyond the recommendation. We have done that for some years now. We have published a report on the functioning of this MOU, which is available in our webpage since uh, August. And we will be now having also the Digital Service Act, which is um, the, 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 the new legislative framework that goes beyond uh, the e-commerce directive and which will uh, provide um, more clarity on the roles of platforms and the roles of how um, notice and take down systems should work. Uh, of course, um, building on the experience of the recommendation, and, and transforming the recommendation in many aspects to into into legal obligations and and, and okay that that's the the project that uh, the commission has in the meantime i can also announce that today uh, we have adopted an ip action plan the ip, IP action plan has a lot of different uh, measures uh, announces a, a lot of different initiatives but in what what concerns to us uh, here, more specifically, is that we uh, announced today that we will, uh, in the near future, in the coming, let's say, one, two years, come with a toolbox that will effectively try to help right holders to protect their uh, rights online. And this will uh, build on uh, the recommendation on uh, illegal content, on the MOU, on online sale counterfeits, on the Digital Service Act. And we will try to provide also work also with, with, with the YPO so that uh, right holders may use connected. Yes, I was disconnected for some time, but I think I'm back. Can someone confirm that I'm back? Yes, yes you are back. All right. Okay. So uh, the the toolbox will be also a certain uh, and, and, and like a recommendation of best practices, building on on our experience with the MOU. Uh, but we'll also try to give some concrete tools uh, for for the for the right holders and for the platforms to use, incorporating in keeping uh, counterfeits and IP infringing goods away from. Uh, the internet. Uh, these tools, we count very much on, on initiatives of the YPO as well, with whom we work very closely, of course. Um, and, uh, and these tools would make it more easier for platforms to, to, to check and verify the, the, the rights that are being used by um, the people giving notice. So, because it's a lot of work for also for platforms when someone say, I have a trademark, this, is, this, 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 this offer is infringing my, 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 my rights or uh, I represent a geographic indication, uh, we need to remove uh, the offer and they have to verify uh, the, the ownership and validity of the rights invoked and 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 the YPO can can help there and making available the databases in a in, in a structured manner and so easy way of 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 uh, platforms to verify and and like this making the all the process less expensive uh, and more efficient uh, so there will be a lot of uh, of, of uh, novelties in the coming years um, I think we need to recover a little bit of time so that we have enough time for, for questions and answers. So I will end up my presentation here. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Georges. 
And now, uh, well, um, it's time to open the Q&A sessions so that, uh, let's see, uh, I mean, um, uh, which questions we have received. Um, I will uh, start by uh, some of the questions we have already received. Um, one of the questions, just let me see a moment. Um, it's, um, one was done by, the first one was done by uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Vincenzo Carrozzino. It was already uh, responded by, uh, I see in the, on the chat by Irene, but I think it is a very interesting uh, question to, to be made uh, also in, in uh, I mean, to share it so that I will try to see uh, if I can find the, the question. So it's a. Uh, I have it if you want. You have to. It. It's just still let me see uh, because I see the, your response, but I do not. I do not find it. I don't know if it has been already. I know here it is. Yes, I do it. It's a, he asked, why should we accept that a private entity decides whether or not a term is generic? Why, well, it's very, uh, it has several parts. Also, why should we accept that this status is supranational? Why, if it is a term is considered presumptively generic, for example, without the decision of a judicial authority in a jurisdiction, Gorgonzola Club, for instance, is it generic? Regardless, if it is registered as a trademark or as a GI. And uh, well, he also uh, says that uh, he would like to mention that the ICANN is about generic top level domains. And then, uh, Irene, please. So, as I, uh, so, ciao Vincenzo, it's nice to see you. Um, so, um, in, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the chat, uh, we should not accept that a private entity decide whether or not something is generic. It's absolutely not to ICANN to decide that. Uh, generic terms are decided either by national authorities uh, or, um, I mean, ideally, generic terms should be decided by the population of a certain country and so uh, through judicial, um, a cert, a cert, a, a judicial through adjudication, um, um, country can bilaterally or multilaterally decide list of terms that are uh, clawed back from generic. And you know we have seen the European uh, wine agreements have done that. Uh, we went uh, many many terms in several countries went from being generic to semi generic or to be 100% protected. This is an incremental strategy. And uh, because a term is protected at that point can no longer be used uh, in labels and that educates the population. Um, but even in a country like the US, there is an example of Coke uh, being be, be, be Clobeck uh, or Singer. Uh, these were trademarks that became generic and were Clobeck. Um, uh, of course, the jurisprudence of how trademarks become generic uh, has evolved. Now we see uh, courts are very resistant in finding that the mark has become generic um, as compared to, say, you know, a few decades ago. Uh, usually, do the courts maneuvers around this definition by saying um, that there is no infringement. And, uh, but we should not accept, absolutely. So uh, the real issue though goes down to details and the facts and where plaintiff, uh, so complainant and uh, respondent are located. Uh, because, uh, and then where the domain uh, is and how the domain is used. Um, you know, I think the Gorgonzola dot best uh, or the Dor Gorgonzola club, uh, they both have different set of facts, but perhaps they're a bit more similar than the say the Taleggio dot EU. Um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a, it's a, the Val del Taleggio, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a very different type of use, which I would say is a fair use. It's a descriptive use of a place for touristic purposes. Uh, there's nothing to do with the cheese, but the, the cheese is a GI versus the Gorgonzola dot best. Uh, and, and I really want, I really encourage everybody to read carefully that decision because that decision is a, it's, it's a, it's a good, good step forward in the burden of proof uh, uh, and the procedural uh, and, and a lot of the dispute 
are decided on details. And this is really where details are, are changing in many ways. Um, but then, you know, if it's, if it's a gorgonzola uh, .org uh, or dot another uh, generic domain that is in a country that doesn't recognize gorgonzola, as, uh, um, um, and so can they do it? And that, that, that's the million dollar question, you know, can Wisconsin do that? And uh, gorgonzola at this stage is still, I might not like it, but it's still a generic term there. So unless we claw it back, and that's necessary to do first, uh, we can't have an harmonization online. And even if we get with this no more generic term, we will still have these issues of limitation and exception through fair use, like the Talejo.eu. Um, and I actually think these are important to keep uh, um, because, because, because there should be some mechanism uh, or you know some sub differentiation uh, that 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 should be allowed for terms that are generic of a product but or generic of a place, and so suddenly you know people living in that place should be able to use them, um, and so also we go down to constitutional issues of uh, freedom of expression, and so these cannot be one hundred percent just just erased. They we we have this issue and we need to work them out case by case. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Irene. We, we have now a, a question for Yvette. Is it, uh, well, it's, uh, uh, do you think that in the EU and in national systems are current legal and administrative rules sufficient to ensure GIs are respected in uh, country code and top, le uh, top level domains? Should EU countries support for a mechanism uh, similar to trademark clearing house or to prevent an authorized uh, delegation of GIs? What do you think? <laughs> to, to reply shortly, uh, uh, the uh, protection should be uh, certainly uh, uh, improved. So enhanced. And uh, this is what the, the study uh, uh, showed that in order to uh, protect uh, uh, intellectual property rights uh, comprising GIs, uh, it's important that uh, measures uh, uh, are uh, adopted uh, um, across uh, the EU. There are good practices, but uh, such good practices uh, should be uh, extended uh, also to other uh, countries and should be extended uh, uh, especially to GIs. Okay, thank you, uh, Yvette. Uh, do you want to say something more about that or? No, then if I... there is uh, any uh, uh, further question, I will be happy to reply. Well, now it's, uh, it's a question for Irene. And now it's um, uh, Mr. Radim Charvat uh, asks if uh, there has been any further development to extend rights under EU DRP to also to GIs, uh, because this, this issue has been s discussed several times at WIPO, and which is the, the current status of the matter. Thank you. So this issue has been discussed yesterday again. Uh, there's been discussion, but there is no actual changes. And I, uh, you know, I tend to be a very pragmatic person. I don't think there's going to be any changes soon, but I strongly uh, support the change in this direction uh, because I think is, there is no uh, any reason why geographic indication should not be uh, treated as uh, uh, trademarks uh, in the UDRP. Um, but I don't see that happening anytime soon, to be honest. Um, there is so much debate in the UDRP. It's not something that is governed um, you know, uh, the European level is governed at the multilateral level. I wouldn't even say it's governed, you know, so much at the U.S. level because it's not just the U.S. who pushes back. It's there is other countries push back as well, uh, and so I don't see any real change in that in in these, uh, you know, in this in uh, in this respect happening soon. But I would like to see them because um, I think we should have. Um, um, the recognition of geographic indication as intellectual property rights uh, without any discrimination against trademark. Uh, also because uh, certification marks 
cannot, and you know, Vincenzo Carozzino pointed out, and I agree with that, these are not binding precedent and the mediators are not judges. And even if we're judges, these are not binding precedents. And so uh, we can have jurisprudence all over the places unless we have a rule that says these are like trademarks, they are IP rights. Um, and, and at that point, the analysis, then on the case, we will see whether there is bad faith, whether there is legitimate interest, maybe there is not, but the, the premise would be a non-discriminatory against geographic indication. And, you know, I, I keep saying the United States has the viticultural areas, but again, wine, as it was also mentioned in another question, is in all in another ball game. Uh, because, uh, you know, because country tech, despite some issues there as well, there is more a broad agreement between the, the various sides of the GI debates on wines and spirits. Uh, but if we could have tr that trickle it down uh, to all other GIs, uh, again, inv invoking non-discrimination, as now we are seeing with non-agricultural GIs, that could also be a, a, a way forward. But I strongly think we should have uh, the GIs in the UDRP, but we don't have them, and I don't think we will have them anytime soon. I might be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong, but as the discussion stand, I don't see that happening, to be honest. Thank you very much, Irene. Okay, we have now a question for uh, Georgia. You uh, said, um, what types of, uh, of enforcement actions or technical and awareness tools are needed by the relevant operators, GI right holders, suppliers, online platforms, advertisers, payment services, uh, social networks, the main name registers, etc. Thank you. George, uh, I think you have a, uh, you are muted. Can you, can you start? Yes, I was. I'm just, uh, could you please uh, repeat? It's, uh, the question is what type of tools? Uh, the, the... Yes, what, time, what types of enforcement actions um, or technical and awareness tools are needed by the relevant operators? To, to protect the eyes and to be protected uh, for not, not uh, acquiring the, the, the wrong uh, product. <laughs> well, I, I, well, the, the tools, the tools that, that are in place, I explained the notice and take down uh, is the mechanism by which uh, as you, um, you know, um, entities uh, that are in charge of enforcing GIs will have to use and need to use in order to protect uh, those GIs and remove uh, infringing goods from, from, from online platforms. That is basically what, what, what it's at hand and, and that we, we do think that it will be improved. Not the legal framework will improve and the material conditions to use it will improve as well with development of concrete tools to, to make these procedures more efficient. Um, awareness is important. The UIPO is very active in doing awareness on IP in general. Uh, of course, consumers need to be informed. Um, that, that will be in summary my, my reply. Thank you, George. And um, I think we have time for a last question, which is uh, um, for, for Irene, which is what steps are needed to ensure recognition of GIs as legitimate forms of IPR to qualify as prior rights in domain name system and on platforms, according to your... So this is a very good question because it goes down to the fact that the, the, the TRIPS agreement does not mandate a way to protect geographic indication. And so member states of WTO remain uh, free to follow this, the system they prefer and they can choose to um, have a sui system or a trademark system. We see that with, with, with the exception of some, you know, some country, now the, the, the sui generis system is becoming more widespread. We have seen in the past 10 years a lot of changes in that. Um, I live in Asia and here, uh, you know, many, 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 many countries are uh, in the past couple of years have revised uh, profoundly their, 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 their laws. But the, this, the fact that we don't have a uniformity 
of uh, uh, treatment, it's the, the, the root of the problem. And so, uh, because there is this potential substitute, which is really no 100% substitutes again, uh, both in the terms of enforcement, and we have seen in some of this jurisprudence by the UDRP, uh, even in the recognition of certification of collective markets actually valid for UDRP proceeding. Um, so how do we do? There is no uniformity, but through international and bilateral agreements that could be negotiated, uh, like the same, you know, the, the clawing back could be negotiated. Uh, and so I think a lot of these issue within time will be all resolved. It depends how long. Uh, we have seen uh, in the world of GIs, even just compared to 10 years ago, uh, we are seeing a very different world. Compared to five years ago, we are also seeing a very different world. When we look at even, you know, countries like the US, like Australia, like New Zealand, much more interest for trade, uh, uh, but also for quality food. Uh, COVID, uh, as the commissioner has said, has tremendously accelerated his attention as well. So it's a long-term process, but the issue is there is no uniformity in treatment of uh, protection of geographical indicators because not all uh, indicators are treated as indication uh, as, uh, you know, as legal entity. And so that is really the main issue. Once we deal with that, um, it will be simpler. And the simplest way is through international agreements. And I'm very, very hopeful now that I've seen a new administration coming up in the United States. I hope the transatlantic partnership will be taken out of the freezer as has been defined and the EU and the US go back to the negotiating table for a comprehensive par partnership like the one done with Canada that has already some good things and you know we need to push uh, for probably more, but we need to bring more people to the table at the international agreement level again. Okay. Uh, ideally at the multilateral level, but at least at the, multi at the, multi you know, the, the multilateral level and the bilateral level between the European Union and other countries. Okay. Um, and so, uh, thank you. Thank you, Rene. Uh, well, we have to wrap it up. So I'm just going to very briefly close with some closing remarks. Uh, uh, we could say that, well, it has been clearly shown that uh, GIs are a key asset to compete globally and that they must be effectively protected. Europe therefore needs a new approach to the way GIs are enforced in the internet world. Well, and also there are two important areas where GIs are, are vulnerable. One is the sales platforms. So it's uh, important to have means to remove the sale product advertised and yearly with GIs. And uh, the global nature of the internet is problematic. So uh, it's uh, a provide the platform is seeking to sell the product in the EU or in a country where GIs are protected. Uh, the European Commission uh, could uh, support producers and this is very important and consumers. Also, um, as we have seen from George's presentation, uh, the EU has already informed, uh, announced uh, that uh, new rules and new projects that will uh, clarify and upgrade the liability and safety rules for online platform services and the forthcoming proposal of the Digital Services Act will aim to harmonize a set of specific and binding uh, obligations in this respect. And uh, well, um, also the, the second area where the risk is uh, important is the, the risk of bad faith registration and allocation of the main names in the case of GIs, where uh, um, we have seen that uh, they are not very protected as a, as a, a base for UDRPs. And uh, finally, we have also seen that in Rennes and Yvette's presentations, the way to address these challenges may be reviewing the legal landscape by adapting the ADR for the European Country Code and top level domains and uh, creating also repositories where people can check where GIs are. Well, now it only remains for me to thank our speakers for their great work and our pilot officer, Mr. Ptak, for its great assistance and all of you and all the team uh, all of you for your virtual or maybe I should say real presence. And I hope you have enjoyed our session and keep on enjoying uh, this wonderful conference. Do not forget that even if it's virtual, we are in, in Brussels so that you maybe can find some chocolate in the airport the website of the Brussels airport and take home so that when you disconnect, you uh, eat them in the real world. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.